Hello, my name is Barbara Kay, and on behalf of my co-host Susan Pertnoy and the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Mosaic. We're on location today at Ballon Isles for a Federation-featured event, Vodka Laka and Sadaka. We'll be back with our guests and our program after this brief message. What if you could change the world? You can. We can do it together. With the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, you are here and we are all connected. Together, we can enrich Jewish life, care for vulnerable populations, and build global Jewish community. That's what we do every day here at home and around the globe. It was a shock when my smart, strong husband had a stroke. His mind was agile, but everything else failed him. I didn't see how he could possibly recover. But through patience, skill, and compassion, the caregivers at Morse Life brought him back to himself. They brought him back to me. Morse Life Short-Term Rehabilitation. Morse Life Health System, honoring senior living. Federation and our overseas partners support the resurgence of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. We also provide humanitarian assistance wherever Jews encounter poverty and crisis. Community, like every gift, counts. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. Welcome back and welcome, Paul Fine. You're the vice chairman of our Federation's campaign and you are chairing these Vodka, Latka and Sadaka events. Tonight, there's one at Ballon Isles. Could you please explain what they are? Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me, Susan. The Vodka Lakas have been in the Palm Beach County area for about seven years. And it's so appropriate because in our gated communities, this is really what kicks off our annual campaign. And there's nothing better than having Vodka Latka and Sadaka charity to kick off the 19, 2016 campaign. That sounds great. Where are some of the communities that you're holding these? Well, last night we had one at Hunter's Run, which is in Boynton Beach. And tonight, as you said, it's at Ballon Isles. Tomorrow night, it's in the southern communities in Boynton Beach. And Thursday, it's the Ibis Golf and Country Club. And what's the purpose of going to these communities as an outreach event? Well, it's primarily to give the uh, communities uh, contributors an opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about Federation. It's an opportunity for us to talk to them about their campaign and their campaign gifts. And it's really more of an interaction between the leadership of the Federation and the communities who are so supportive of the Federation on an annual basis. Well, that's terrific. Being a vice chair of campaign is a yeoman's job. Why did you take it on? Well, my wife and I moved here about 12 years ago. And when we first came here, obviously we came to retire and to enjoy life. And then shortly after we came here, we realized there was more than just playing golf and going out for dinner. We were active in our home community, which was in Wilmington, Delaware. And we f soon realized that it was important for us to continue to give back. We've been fortunate all our lives and we felt an obligation especially coming to a new community, to do something to give back to the community and to those in need. And the way we obviously did it here was through our obligation and commitment to the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County. How did you learn to be philanthropic? Well, I learned initially from my parents uh, when we were uh, up north. Uh, but um, many times it's because you get a mentor, you have a mentor. I had a mentor in Wilmington when I was very young who brought me through the chair, so to speak, in terms of getting involved with Federation. I started at the bottom, worked myself up, learned a lot about the community, learned about the needs of the community and how important it was for those of us who were relatively successful to not forget from whence we came and to make sure that we gave back to the community in the most appropriate way we can. 
that is by contr contributing to the campaign, but also not only putting our money where our mouth is, but also working hard for the benefit of the community. This is your second year as a vice campaign chair, yes. along with Barry Berg, who's right. the campaign chair. Correct. Uh, what have you done or have you learned from the 2015 campaign to implement in this new year? Well, we really start off with three major goals. The first goal was to expand the base of those people who were actively involved in the campaign. Uh, that was a two-year program for us, and we're very pleased that we have over 200 people who have volunteered oh. for the 2016 campaign. The second goal we had, which is an obvious one, is to raise more money from the campaign. We have approximately 130,000 Jewish people in Palm Beach County, and we raise approximately 15 and a half to 16 million dollars, which is about 5% of the population. So we have a long way to go. The positive thing is that for this year, 2015 campaign, we're over 5% increase on the same card value that we had last year. So we're moving in the right direction, you but it's are. important that we expand the base. The third thing that we had as a goal was to make sure that we were monitoring and doing the best we could in the changes in philanthropic trends. Campaigns change, the way we uh, interact with, computer, with contributors change, and it's important that we uh, stay ahead of the curve to make sure that we in the campaign are doing the best we can to be positive and to be proactive in making sure we do everything we can to expand the base make sure we bring as many people into the campaign in a positive way so that when we finish our campaign everyone leaves with a good taste in their mouth. Sounds like you're totally on top of your game. Try what, to. Tell us some of the events that you have planned for this year. Well we have uh, we had a kickoff campaign uh, last Monday at Bethel Synagogue and on Flagler which was terrific. It was hosted by Jerry Greenfield from Ben and Jerry Ice Cream which was a great thing. We had over 400 it was, people there. Well, it was terrific. Uh, we have a, a, a blue and white ball, which is our major gifts function next month, which is all signs it's going to be successful. The women's philanthropy through the line of Judah are having a terrific um, uh, in campaign next, next month, having their luncheon. And uh, we have a number of different events, some which are held in Palm Beach and some are held in Boynton Beach to try to cover as many of the community's contributors as we can between now and April, which is traditionally when the campaign ends and we have a closing event in support of thanking all the people who have made contributions. And thanking you, too. I appreciate you being here, thank you. and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. We'll be back with the remainder of our program after this brief message. Thousands of community members come together through programs and services provided by Federation and our local partner agencies to create a vibrant and vital community in Palm Beach County. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. My wife was the light of my life. Being her caregiver was both a joy and a challenge. I was determined to stick with it, but I needed help. Moore's life was there. I lost her after a long journey, but now Moore's life comes to help me. I look forward to seeing them. Moore's Life Home Healthcare. Moore's Life Health System, honoring senior living. Federation and our overseas partners support the resurgence of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. We also provide humanitarian assistance wherever Jews encounter poverty and crisis. Community, like every gift, counts. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. Welcome back from Mosaic, and welcome to you, Dr. Charles Asher Small. Thank you. Thanks for having <laughs> Correct, me. a distinguished uh, scholar. You're really amazing man, coupled with the fact that you're the director of ISGAP. Now, in the beginning of the program, Susan was talking to the campaign, general campaign chair for the event that you're speaking at, and 
We were talking about the need for people to get together to understand why it's important to be philanthropic, why we have to band together as a people. Your ISCAP, I, because I was getting to see you, I had to go into what ISCAP was. I never heard of it before, quite frankly. I think everybody listening here better learn what ISCAP is. Share it. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here with you, so thank you. It's a you. pleasure. So ISGAP is the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. ISGAP was started in 2004. Um, Elie Wiesel is our honorary president. He inspired us to create the institute in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, I was with him at a special UN conference that took place in New York in 2003. And from this, our sort of a network of scholars got together and created this institute. We moved it to Yale in 2006. And at Yale, we were the first research center ever, which is amazing, at a North American university. Mm -hmm. And we were there for five years, and then we've become independent. Our headquarters is in New York, and we do academic programming now at McGill, Harvard, and Columbia. We did a lot of work at the University of Miami. We're at Sapienza in Rome, which is the largest European university. Mm -hmm. We're now at the Cerbon and the CNRS in Paris. Oh, We're wow. at Tel Aviv University. And we have a special teacher training program that we started last summer at Oxford University where we took 28 professors from 17 countries, 80% of them were not Jewish, and we taught them how to teach courses on contemporary anti-Semitism because amazingly, there are no courses on contemporary anti-Semitism in the academy, in the United States, in, in United Canada, States, right. and Europe. So we're training professors and every year we hope we'll graduate up to 50 professors a year. They agree by contract to uh, go back to their home university and the course that they create with us, they teach for credits. So we're tr basically trying to create a space in the academy for faculty and students in the classroom to study, to map, to decode contemporary anti-Semitism and with this have the basis, the intellectual mm -hmm. and scholarly basis to fight anti-Semitism. So we're not fighting anti-Semitism in the corridors, we're fighting it in the classroom, which is unfortunately urgently needed. Yeah, well, it's very needed across the country. Students all over the United States, American students, yeah. are constantly being barraged by anti-Israel, anti-Semitic rhetoric, yeah. and they don't know how to respond. Exactly. So there's been a series of studies in the past few months that show that more than 70 percent of American students on, on campuses, on American mm -hmm. campuses, have experienced or witnessed firsthand an anti-Semitic act. Other groups, other minority groups, such as African Americans and, and women and gay people, they experience discrimination, but it's at about 10 times lower than the Jewish community. Yeah. So there's a crisis happening. And what basically is happening is that the demonization of Israel is the new anti-Semitism. It's the demonization of Jewish peoplehood. So many people in the United States hope that the problems of Israel, the demonization of Israel would stay in the Middle East. But what we're seeing is young Jewish students in Europe, in North America, in the United States, who go to a Hillel, mm -hmm. who go to a Chabad house, who go to a Jewish communal organization or student organization on campus. Because Israel's been so demonized and Jewish peoplehood has been so demonized, Jewish kids at the best universities in our country who go to a Hillel, who go to show some sort of cultural or religious affiliation to Jewish peoplehood mm -hmm. or to Israel are sort of deemed problematic. So if Israel is a racist apartheid Nazi state as the BDS movement and some of our finest mm -hmm. professors will label it in the classroom, kids going to a, an organization that has, is connected to Israel are now called racist, Islamophobic, they're demonized. And this is the new anti-Semitism, the demonization of who we are as a people. Do, th do, do you think that people realize how, how um, much of a disease this is and how um, diminishing it is and how terrible. And I, I don't even know when it started. In the, in the late 1800s when they started with the Protocols of Zion, yeah. that was the beginning of the Shoah yeah. and, exactly. uh, or the concept of the Shoah. How do we teach people that they can't disregard people because they don't look like them, they don't sound like them, and they don't belong to the same organization and all of a sudden they're demons? Right. So I'm afraid this is a very serious issue, especially in the United States at this moment. I think you spoke about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. 
This was a forged document that emanated, came out of Russia or, par or mm -hmm. France in the late 1800s, and it spoke about a Jewish cabal or some secret meetings and conspiracies of Jews to take over the world and mm -hmm. to take over the banks. The thing about the Holocaust, as we know, it didn't begin with railroad tracks and the bricks of the crematorium. It began with words and it began with ideas. Mm -hmm. And the protocols justified the Holocaust. It justified the Jewish communities in Europe to be marginalized, to be removed from their place of employment, to be taken out of their homes and put into ghettos, and eventually put into camps and, and, and decimated, killed, destroyed. It's the words and ideas that did this. Yeah. And those words and ideas forged the, the intellectual, the ideological, and the theological core, the core foundation of radical political Islam. Through the Muslim Brotherhood and others over the last hundred years, they've been propagating the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's now the second most popular book in many Arab countries. It's amazing, good. And, and, and the, the tragedy is, in the sort of postmodern, politically correct moment, the media of record, our best universities, and now even the administration questions our very use of the word radical political Islam or Islamism. But this is a, a well-established notion. The leading scholars, leading Muslim scholars who are fighting this reactionary movement that is not only genocidal in its anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. and I'm choosing my words carefully, it's genocidal in its anti-Semitism. It's also anti-religious minorities, it's anti-women, it subjugates women, women, and advocates the killing of gay people. So if we are truly liberal, if we are truly defending democratic principles and human rights, if we truly care about international law, if we truly care about not allowing the horrors of the past to be repeated, these are, this is a, re a reactionary social movement that is using anti-Semitism, focusing on the Jew, focusing on the Israeli, focusing on, focusing on the Zionist, while they run amok and take over institutions, take over mosques, take over entire societies, while we are focusing, like the puppeteer, on the Jew. So this is a very dangerous mov movement, and unfortunately, our leading intellectuals, our leading media of record have remained confused on this issue, to say the least. You know, a lot of the scholars and professors at these, at these universities are afraid to get involved. They don't pursue sure. the issue, and they don't educate themselves. 100%. Actually, I would even argue that anti-Semitism, contemporary anti-Semitism, there were several phases of anti-Semitism. There was the religious Christian phase, then there was the racist nationalist phase. Those are gladly things of the past, but today it's the attack on Jewish peoplehood. And I think in our so social circles, if you're Christian anti-Semitic like the past, you're removed from the social circle. If you're racist in your anti-Semitism, it's not acceptable in the, the fine networks and circles and institutions that we go to. But Jew attacking Jewish peoplehood, attacking Israel, labeling it, dehumanizing it, is not only acceptable, it's the way to get ahead. If you want to be a journalist and you want to work in the New York Times or for CNN or for Al Jazeera, if you want to teach at Yale, if you want to go to the Ivy Leagues, you have to prove your bona fides by, pr by pr showing that you're critical of Zionism, and that you're different, that you're a, you're a good Jew. And, and this is very dangerous. This is, and, and we know from history that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. No. And we can see this reactionary social movement is killing Muslims, killing moderate Muslims, and this problem is expanding into Europe and other parts of the world. Yeah, and Saudi, uh, the, in the newspaper, came out after the Gaza attack, came out with, uh, oh, wonderful Hitler, you did a great job. Yeah, you yeah. killed the Jews, you killed the pigs. I mean, when you read about it in a, in a newspaper, when you hear about it on television, it's so insightful. Yeah. It's yeah. scary. Yeah. Now you can see through the stabbings, through the shootings, through the attacks. It's that awful. There's, there's but they, they do a better job, from what I understand, in Europe than we're doing here in America. Yeah. Why is that? So I would, I would, I would agree with you. I think after the Charlie Hebdo attacks and mm -hmm. the attack on the kosher supermarket, that there was an awakening in France, an awakening by scholars and intellectuals, and I think ma major journalists in the uh, media of record, that there's something wrong here. When they attacked the whole uh, 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 um, journalists, uh, mm -hmm. who practice freedom of speech, when they went into a kosher supermarket on the Yuva Shabbat and they executed in cold blood 
uh, Jewish men who said they were Jewish and Mr. Koulibaly who belonged to Al-Qaeda, this anti-Semitic movement, executed them. Um, there was an awakening in France that this was an anti-Semitic, anti-democratic movement. Um, and I think going into the kosher supermarket uh, raised the fears that there's some, some real anti-Semitism happening again in Europe. And the French government and some of the media and some of the intellectual elites are really speaking up, are really changing policy to address this crisis. And tragically, I have to say tragically, when the United States government did not name the problem, the French government named it an anti-Semitic act, unfortunately this administration still to this day did not name the fact, did not, did not name the act when Mr. Koulibaly, the executioner that went into a kosher market on the eve of Shabbat and killed Jews because they were Jews, the, this administration has not admitted this to be an anti-Semitic act. Not only is this an anti-Semitic act, not only is this an anti-Semitic act from a reactionary social movement, this is an anti-Semitic act from a movement that explicitly uses genocidal anti-Semitism in its warped political and religious movement. They use these, the Protocols of the Elders mm -hmm. of Zion as a foundational element of this reactionary movement, and it is an anti-Semitic movement, as, as they readily and happily admit. They blame Jews for all the problems in the world. Not only do they want to call for the, don't they call for Israel's destruction, they call for the annihilation of the Jewish people. And this goes from Al-Qaeda to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the head of the Muslim bro Brotherhood, Kawadari, the chief mm -hmm. of the Muslim Brotherhood, calls for the continuation, that it's Muslims' responsibility to continue the work, continue the annihilation of the, of the Jewish people that Hitler started. That the Muslims, the believers, need to complete this. And our administration and other Western governments enter and engage into, into discussions with this, with this movement. And this is a movement that we really need to study, to understand, and to realize that this is not only anti-Semitic, but it's, it's anti-democratic, it's anti-American, it's anti-humane. It's like a tsunami that yeah. just takes over. It's like a disease. Oh, horrible disease. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that um, you are developing something. I mean, what you're working on and the papers that you're working on, the scholars that you're working with, what is the impact that you're having with this? So it's a I good mean, question. really, yeah. when you think about, oh, we are 0.025% of the world's population. What is that? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And we're responsible for all of the evils that take place. Right. So what, what do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen with what you're doing? Well, we're trying to map and decode not only the rise of this reactionary social movement, but also to map and decode and to try to understand why among intellectuals, and sort of in this postmodern mm -hmm. philosophical moment, in this politically correct moment, why do people who claim to be liberal, uh, as I am uh, very much part of the sort of human rights tradition, and I come from a social democratic country, I'm Canadian, uh, I'm on the left politically, I was part of the anti-apartheid movement, I was a leader of the anti-apartheid mm -hmm. movement, I come from a country where medicine is socialized, where I went to McGill University and I paid roughly $200 a year for the equivalent of an Ivy League education. I come from a country where I think education and healthcare are human rights. Um, and I believe that all citizens need to be equal under the law. This is sort of a progressive social democratic worldview and human rights tradition that I come out of. Um, so we're trying to map and decode why liberals are unable to forcibly speak out against this reactionary social movement and defend the rights of Muslim women, of moderate Muslims, of minorities like the Yazdis and Christians of the Middle East, why is there this silent? Why is there this silent when over 300,000 Syrians have been killed in the last three years? There's eight million refugees, half the country of Syria has been made into refugees, mm -hmm. 60 million refugees in the last seven years, and why, why are we silent? I don't know, that's a very good reason. So we are trying to map and decode this with leading scholars from around the world and our impact, we you know we have spaces now at some of the finest universities in the world where we're exploring these issues. We're giving a space for faculty and students to come together and discuss and study and debate these issues. Um, and we're breaking a taboo in a sense because of the silence, the silencing of the better universities and the media of record. Just to answer what happened in Yale, because I think they closed out the program. Right. It's a explain, long explain that Yale was one of the first universities to ever have that established, and you established it. Yes, yeah, so my colleagues and I established it, and we were closed. 
And actually we're working on a research project which is very much connected to why it was closed. We're actually following the money. We're following uh, the funding of Ivy League universities by the Muslim Brotherhood and by other, by other Islamists in this country. Mm -hmm. And we're documenting how many universities are happy to take the funding of uh, individuals and organizations with very reactionary, anti-democratic, sexist, homophobic, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish uh, values, but they're happy to take the money. So we're documenting the impact the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists have in terms of their funding, but also their intellectual history at American universities. Yeah, but it had to be quite shocking for you. What's, tell me, in two minutes that are left between us, what is the future? Give me a prognosis. Give me something that makes me feel good. So the future is, I think Europe is waking up. The Israelis are on the cutting edge. I think Israel is, um, in a sense, maybe because there's no choice, but Israel is a democratic country on the front line. Uh, it's a light on two nations, literally, as we celebrate Hanukkah, as we rem remember what the Jewish people's uh, you know, covenant with God is. Israel is the only democracy. Israel is the only country in the region with all its problems and contradictions that is fighting against this barbaric, uh, anti-human movement. I think Europe is beginning to wake up. Mm -hmm. Some of the policies, despite the anti-Semitism, despite the anti-Israel legacy of European countries like France, uh, France is developing uh, effective policies that acknowledge the reality of radical political Islam and anti-Semitism. The discourse is shifting in Europe and I hope the discourse will begin to shift here and it won't take uh, more tragedies to make the discourse change. So I think we should pay attention to Europe. Many people write Europe off as a lost cause. I think there's a, the, the problems are more acute, the threats are more serious, but because of that, the discussions, the discourse, the awareness is much deeper. So I think we should turn to England and France. There's, there is hope there. There's hope? Yeah, and I think they can inform us uh, and save us from some of the problems that they've experienced if we pay attention. Well, I have to tell you, you're doing a marvelous job. Thank I really, I really have to, I'm very proud of what you're doing because it's, it seems like that's the way we're going to be able to enjoy the future, hopefully, because we can't live like this. No, and we have to remember, democracy is not inherited. Every generation has to defend and expand democratic principles and human rights. Such a pleasure to have the opportunity to meet you. Thank you. Really, what you're here. doing is so, so important. And it's particularly important for you to speak to the people that are gathered here tonight, make them understand how collectively important they can be. Thank you, and thank you for being with us as well. Be with us again next week when we have another look into the Jewish world. Goodbye from Mosaic.